This podcast is brought to you by Bloomberg Law. For more information about our professional services for the legal industry, please call 212-617-6569. You're listening to the Bloomberg Law Intellectual Property Review. I'm Josh Block. Why is the copyright on the software that's running your computer different from the copyright on the books, movies, and music that you own? Coming up, the case of Apple versus Psystar, where a federal appellate court affirmed a lower court ruling that when you buy the operating system software that runs your Mac, you are not its owner, but a licensee. We'll consider that decision and why that matters. But first, a review of recent IP developments reported by Bloomberg News. The overall unemployment rate may still be high at 9.1%, but one job currently in high demand is that of patent lawyer. While just 3% of U.S. lawyers are patent attorneys, 15% of law firm openings are for the specialty. The legal recruiters at Lateral Link reported that some law firms are almost doubling the fee they pay when the recruiter can place a patent lawyer. One reason for the current demand is the America Invents Act. The U.S. patent system overhaul changes how patents are processed and reviewed. In the wake of Taylor Branch's article in The Atlantic, The Shame of College Sports, the movement to challenge the NCAA may be gaining momentum. In a case with intellectual property implications, Branch's longtime friend Bill Russell has filed a lawsuit against the NCAA. The lawsuit claims that by keeping former student-athletes from receiving compensation for the commercial use of their images, the NCAA violates antitrust laws. The NCAA sells Russell's image in videos and photos. The video game maker Electronic Arts is also named as a defendant. Last week, the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments in Golan v. Holder, a challenge to a federal copyright law. Known as Section 514, the law extended copyright protection to some foreign works, taking them out of the public domain. The ruling of the court will affect rights to works by Alfred Hitchcock, Pablo Picasso, and Igor Stravinsky. The justices signaled that they are divided over the constitutionality of the law, which aimed to harmonize U.S. law with other countries. I'm joined now by Jessica McKinney, a writer and editor of Bloomberg Law's Intellectual Property Law Report. Um, Jessica, will you explain what Psystar was doing and what what they were selling? Uh, basically, what Psystar did was... Uh, they manufactured and sold their own computers, which they first called Open Macs, and then they changed the name to Open Computers. And uh, what they did was they had their own computers, but they had Apple's Mac OS X software pre-installed in the computer. And they also um, included an unopened copy of the software uh, with each computer that was sold as well. What was Systar's argument that they were not infringing on Apple's copyright on the operating system uh, software when they did this? Well, the main issue on appeal to uh, the, in, on appeal to the Ninth Circuit was the application of the copyright copyright misuse doctrine. Uh, so Systar was basically saying that uh, Apple's software license agreement, which comes with uh, every copy of the Mac OS X software, uh, that that was uh, anti-competitive and uh, what it resulted in copyright misuse. And so that was their argument, that even if they were infringing Apple's copyright, that they should still be shielded from liability as a result of the copyright misuse doctrine. And uh, Apple's software license agreement basically said that uh, the Mac OS X could only be used on Apple computers only and not on any other type of computer. You know, there's a Microsoft operating system, and that can generally run on a computer made by any manufacturer, and an Apple operating system can be run only on a computer manufactured by Apple. That seems like a bit of a unique situation. Um, It does. It's really an example of um, Apple or any software manufacturer just trying to control the use of their copyrighted material and uh, to prevent infringement. And... Really, the distinction comes down to when you look at these agreements uh, to determine if the person buying the software is a licensee of the software or uh, they own it. And uh, then the first cell doctrine of U.S. copyright law comes into play. And there is a Ninth Circuit decision from last year, Werner v. Autodesk, uh, where the Ninth Circuit just basically reviewed um, its precedent on the question and set forth a test for you know, whether somebody is a licensee or an owner of software. And under that test, uh, basically you're considered a licensee of the software. If somewhere in the license agreement, it, it says that the licensor retains title and that it's only a license. And also if they impose notable use restrictions 
and um, significant transfer restrictions. So that's an interesting idea. When I buy a Mac that ha runs the Apple or the Mac operating system, now I'm a licensee as instead of an owner. That's a little different than the way we view uh, copyrights on other works. Is that right? Um, it isn't. It isn't. I mean, the first cell doctrine applies to anything. You know, it can apply to physical items like books or whatnot. Um, it's really just looking at, uh, you have the same rights in software as you do with respect to any other work under the Copyright Act. It's just like how to determine whether, you know, the first cell doctrine applies to you or whether it doesn't. And so in that respect, like the application of the first cell doctrine is a little different in the context of software as opposed to other copyrighted works um, due to the Ninth Circuit's decision in Burner. Uh, which, by the way, was recently uh, appealed to the Supreme Court, which denied cert in the act. Systar had to know that this was a huge risk to their business model, or at least this element of it, that selling computers with the Apple software. So it seems to me on some level some sort of policy battle or some policy choice that maybe they were trying to fight. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, one, I think it's a policy battle. You know, everybody doesn't really like the idea of Apple being so restrictive and how its products are used and... You know, I mean, on the other hand of the spectrum, I mean, Apple, you know, it spends a lot of time, resources, and developing these products, and, you know, they want to have good quality control and make sure that their products are operating in the best way possible. And so, I mean, Apple's argument is that, you know, they spend all this time in, like, making superior products, and it's not fair, you know, if another company comes along and if they try to use Apple software with different hardware, and, and the result is the, the software doesn't operate as well as it would with the Apple hardware. So... I mean, if you look at it from both sides, it kind of makes sense. And, you know, I think it definitely was, uh, there were policy motivations behind what Sysar was doing. Um, also, they started selling these uh, open computers in 2008, uh, which was before the Ninth Circuit's decision in Werner v. Autodesk, so they probably thought that they had a better chance um, with their, you know, first sell doctrine and copyright misuse argument than actually was the case. So what are the ramifications of this decision for Apple, for the computer software industry, and for consumers, if there are any? Well, um, for Apple, it's obviously when, you know, I think going forward, they're, they can feel pretty comfortable with doing what they've been doing with their software license agreements and restricting their software to their own hardware. You know, maybe for consumers, it might be good, it might not be good. It may, it, not good in the sense that consumers might want, like, better choices. You know, maybe it's cheaper to buy somebody else's computer with the Apple software installed in it. On the other hand, you know, maybe it works out better if they use the Apple software and the hardware because, um, you know, the overall experience is better and everything works as intended. I mean, going forward, this just kind of solidifies the fact that um, when it comes to software, you know, it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, to be considered... Uh, an owner of software as opposed to a licensee under the Ninth Circuit's test in Verner. Um, as long as you craft a software license agreement that covers, you know, the basic elements of what's needed under the test, the first cell doctrine won't apply to you at all. And, um, you know, as long as you have that in place, and now the, co the Ninth Circuit's saying that copyright, copyright misuse um, is, is really, it's a hard defense to prove. Um, in this case, they didn't prove it. I think they've only... Uh, the defense has only been successful in the Ninth Circuit in one other occasion back in the 90s. So when it comes to software, um, you know, it's just really hard to uh, engage in certain activities without violating someone's copyright if everything's done correctly. So how far does this go? Can I resell my Mac with this software installed on it? Uh, no, you would not be able to. Um, the, the, uh, under, it, you couldn't do it under the first cell doctrine under uh, the Werner precedent. If I buy a Mac and I have it for a year and I decide it's time to sell it, that would be a copyright infringement. Um, exactly, yes, because you would be, you know, selling the software without Apple's permission. And, you know, if they wanted to, they could pursue a copyright action against you. I mean, maybe they wouldn't. They're probably not going to file, like, hundreds of copyright actions. But, you know, you might be the one case that they decide to file against. So probably not a good idea. Do you have any sense of what's next for Systar? Does this effectively end their challenge? I pretty much think so, yes. I mean, up on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, um, in light of the Supreme Court denying cert in the Werner v. Autodis case, it, they're probably not likely to take up this case either. And, you know, going forward, um, you know, they, pretty, they, don't pretty, they don't have any arguments left. That's Jessica McKinney. You can read the Law Report article that she wrote about this case, along with the opinion, the complaint, and other court filings at BloombergLaw.com. We'll post a new podcast each Tuesday. Until then, thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Law Intellectual Property Review. 
Copyright 2011, Bloomberg Finance LP, all rights reserved. The views expressed herein are those of the speakers and not of Bloomberg Finance LP. These discussions are for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice, which has to be addressed to particular facts and circumstances involved in any given situation. Bloomberg Finance LP and its affiliated entities do not take responsibility for the content contained herein and do not make any representation or warranty as to its completeness or accuracy.